Ça tourne. Mademoiselle Chanel, deux premières. I hope I look all right. The sound of the clap reminds me of a man I saw slap a woman in the street. She deserved it. I said to myself, if she doesn't watch it, she's going to get a good slap. And she did. At the age of 88, Gabrielle Chanel, nicknamed Coco, the Grand Dame of French fashion, was a sprightly old woman. But after her death, on January 10, 1971, her couture house started to collapse. Karl Lagerfeld, who replaced her 10 years later, transformed it with innovations that Mademoiselle Chanel might not have liked, but he retained what is acknowledged to be the Chanel style. France has always led the way in women's fashion. Several days before the presentation of the Spring 91 collection, the atmosphere in the studio is not as tense as in Mademoiselle Chanel's heyday. A perpetually anxious perfectionist, she would unstitch and redo her designs up to the last minute. Things weren't done in the same way before World War II. Not all the models were made. The headdress designer presented the cloth and they chose from it. The method was very different. The fashion designers even bought designs from outside people and to work the way Coco did and the way people worked in the 50s, that hadn't existed before. Before it was a huge undertaking because one should remember that a couture dress, relatively speaking, did not cost more than a luxury ready to wear today. On Saturday, January 9th, 1971, things were at fever pitch in the same atelier. All the employees anxiously awaited the arrival of Coco Chanel. Mademoiselle, who lived at the Ritz, was giving last-minute changes to her closest collaborator. I arrived at the Ritz, and she was almost ready. I sat down beside her as she put on her makeup. I explained what was planned for the day. During the shows, she daydreamed a lot. She was like a sleepwalker. She didn't know how to draw, but she would take bed covers, clothes, and cut patterns out of them. Very often, she would cut patterns out of bed sheets. When I'd get there, she would show me what she'd done during the night, and she tried to explain what she wanted so that I could put it on paper for her. Then, as usual, there was pandemonium at the boutique on the Rue Cambon. The two women arrived around noon. Everyone ran to hide because we were afraid. When Mademoiselle arrived, we were thinking, my God, what's she going to say today? So we all steered clear of the main staircase. I'd warn everyone when Mademoiselle was arriving, and we'd spray the staircase with perfume for her arrival. With which perfume? Oh, number five. Mademoiselle Chanel used only number five, of course. What's the most difficult thing in your profession? To allow a woman to move comfortably, not to feel disguised, not to change her attitude, stay the way she is. Well, that's very difficult, and I think that's my gift, if gift it is. I think that I have it. On the last Saturday of her life, she went into the vast showroom to see the new models that she had designed. Chanel believed in her own style. And it's very unsettling to realize that uh, this silhouette, which she imposed on the world, was in fact her own, her own slenderness. These were her weapons, which she seduced the world with. But people liked it, and up to the last minute, she applied herself to creating it. Women. Mademoiselle Chanel was a very solitary person at the end of her life, and so on weekends she didn't like being alone. Friends went to see her, but most of the time she was alone. She hated being alone. It didn't matter if lunch was interesting or gloomy, every day was different. But then there was the famous evening ceremony, the exit through the door before going down the stairs. How many times people had to stand there for hours talking with her between those two doors before she finally left. She was so afraid of solitude that she became attached to a man 50 years her junior, Francois Mironnet. The first time, I listened to her talk. It lasted from two in the afternoon on a Saturday afternoon until nine that evening, non-stop. A woman who is not loved is nothing, and that's that. No matter how old she is, 
young, old, mother, mistress, whatever, a woman who is not loved is a lost woman. We had a platonic friendship. Uh, on two occasions, it deteriorated into feelings of love on her part. Once uh, in the car. And I got out of the car very quickly. Another time in Lausanne, sitting at a table where in front of other people, she asked me to elope with her. There again, I left immediately. Yes, she had passionate relationships with everyone who was close to her, not just with me. She was someone who went through life uh, like a tornado, and her relationships were always that way, always extreme, as much in her work as in her daily life. Always very, very passionate relationships. Authoritarian, abusive, this old woman of genius, high priestess of French haute couture, had only a few friends left in her last years. They could be counted on the fingers of one hand. Her detractors were numerous. I think she was a mean person, that she could be horrible to all her friends, and that she ended up very much alone, but that happens to everyone, not just to fashion designers. It's more a question of personality than a profession. You know, it's easy for the fashion world to say that it's because of the profession, but I think it's a simple question of personality. Look at other examples. Marlena Dietrich was very much alone as well. But if people who are mean to their friends end up all alone, we're not going to cry over them, are we? A cruel but realistic analysis coming from the man who inherited the Chanel mantle. But those who worked with her up to the end do not refute it. Talent does not excuse the tyranny which Coco Chanel exerted over her subordinates up to the very last days. The day before, she'd gone through the same old song and dance about coming to work. We'd had it up to here with her and said, no, we're not coming tomorrow. Oh, she would be so furious when we stood up to her like that. We never thought that she'd be dead the next day. If we had known, we would have gone to work and that might have saved her life. She'd say, really now, they don't want to work. Her workers never stopped working, because we always worked the two weekends before the collections, not to mention that we'd stay late at night to present the new models. Mademoiselle would say, I have to make Manon cry. She has to bathe the collection with her tears. It was a superstition with her. So I had a friend who would say to me, pinch yourself, think of something, cry, so she'll be happy. Well, sometimes I managed to cry, but other times I didn't even need to force myself because I thought that the model I was presenting was good, and she'd tear the stitches out and ask for me to have it ready for the next day. On Sunday at 1 p.m., one of her last friends went to see her. I spent Sundays with her. It was the day she was alone, the day that she hated because she couldn't go in and work that day. And that last Sunday it was extraordinary because she took so long to get dressed. It was as if she were taking the time that she'd never taken before. And then we went downstairs to the Ritz to have lunch around 2.30. And she talked about her mother. She said, I won't be able to resist making a dress with a bustle like the kind my mother wore. And then we went to the racetrack. Well, that was obviously the kind of promenade she'd done in her youth. And in fact, when we got back to the Ritz, she said, you see, in the past, there was the smell of horses and men who loved me. Oh, I couldn't seem to reassure her. We talked, and she had an almost physical need for presence. I can still see her as I said goodbye at the entrance to the Ritz. It was the end of the afternoon, and she was going to have her dinner brought to her on a tray. And the next day, Monday, she was going to be back at work on her collection. And her final words to me were, come see me at the Rue Cambon at the end of the afternoon. I'll be working. At the end of the afternoon, alone in her hotel room, Coco Chanel does not feel well. She calls Lilou Marcon. 
Around 6 p.m. she called me and said, I told you I wasn't feeling well, but now you really must come because I'm really not feeling well at all. I think I'm dying. I told her her voice sounded very good for somebody who was about to die. I didn't believe her at all. I thought she was putting on her usual show. She was always telling me she was about to die when she wanted me to come and see her. I get so busy with what I'm doing that I become totally exhausted. I think that I'll have a collection ready in four or five days. It kills me. I went to see her around 6.30 p.m., and I was immediately frightened by her paleness and uh, the fact that the window was wide open. It was January, it was freezing outside, and she was bathed in sweat. One morning she said to me at the Ritz, you know, I'd like to die like de Gaulle. Well, she died the same way de Gaulle did. So when I arrived, it was really the end, and I took her hand and did what she asked me to do. Everyone who got to know her thought she was immortal, that she'd lived to be over a hundred, so it was quite a shock. When I saw her, I immediately thought, this is not possible. She always told us, the day I die, you and Francois, make sure I look elegant and then carefully put me in the Cadillac between the two of you with a hat over my eyes. When you get to the border, say that uh, the old lady is sleeping and uh, show my passport and say that uh, I'm not to be disturbed. And then you quietly bury me in Lausanne without saying anything to anyone. But one does not bury the symbol of French elegance hastily. Coco Chanel, who died in solitude, was given a state funeral. At the Madeleine, her few friends, her workers, and the two Paris came to pay their respects to the woman who had found happiness only in her work. When you're alone in life, like I am, if you don't watch out, everything very easily becomes absolutely disgusting and unbearable. A woman without a husband is a woman to be pitied, yes. She cannot see life as it really is. She's living a lie. 